Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my podcast, Girl with Camera. In this episode, it's my pleasure to be talking to a film director and producer, Anton Arenko. We will talk about his latest film called A Manchester Story, but that film has a positive vibe, so we will get that straight as well. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you um, for introducing me. It's uh, great to be on. I'm so happy you said yes, um, because that story is, you know, it has been told from very different angles, um, actually, you know, many times, but this has a positive vibe. And of course, I'm going to let you speak about that. So um, can you just like, if we start from the beginning, can you just tell me like why or what made you do this or what inspired you to do this like are you personally connected to it or are you just like yeah what's the story um so i'm originally from manchester um and at the time of the bombing happened i kind of um i was still living in manchester at the time but i was due to move to university but i was kind of like disconnected afterwards i didn't really go into the city much and stuff and i kind of um, it was kind of in the background, but I was watching like documentaries that were coming out um, about it. And I just thought they were very, you know, very down in tone, very negative. And obviously, of course, they're going to focus on the tragedy of the event. But I think they missed the overall thing of people coming together. And that's what I could see. Uh, and that's what I was hearing about. Um So I went to university and it, the year anniversary was kind of coming around. Um, and so it got, you know, to national importance again. People were talking about it again. And again, I was seeing uh, seeing more documentaries and stuff and people and news reports, and it's just all been very negative and down. And I thought, you know, I think something needs to be different here. So I kind of, at first, I kind of thought maybe I could do something short and stuff. But then I kind of thought on a bigger scale. So I started hearing about um, people doing particular things in the aftermath. Uh, first person was Vegan Murray, who's the who's the first pen, person in my documentary who's who sadly lost her son, Martin. Um, and she was doing a lot of courageous things. And it really stuck in my mind to myself and a lot of people in the city and out, outside of how strong she was and resilient she was. And then I started hearing about other people doing different things. Um, and I just noticed this pattern of people who were just really going, who had been affected so horribly by it uh, or differently by it, or maybe weren't there, but were inspired by it. And they were kind of coming together to do something better for their communities around them. And I was like, you know, someone maybe needs to try and do something. So I thought um, I'd try and speak to people and see what I, what I could find out really. Yeah, because exactly like, a lot of like media and a lot of other films are just focused on basically the tragedy and the aftermath from like a negative point of view. But um, I know that this city is strong and it actually was more united than ever um, after the tragedy. So I think like Manchester is, um, and, and this story should be told that people actually were united and May, they were doing amazing things. So I'm glad that you decided to make this film and show a lot of people um, that actually made those positive things. Um, so, and yeah, it was interesting when you said like you you were thinking about something short, but then you actually yeah. made it in a feature film. <laughs> so um, I have to compare it to my producers, my co-producer, Steve, who like, because I was kind of testing the water because I thought, I thought about it and... I was kind of nervous a lot initially, obviously, to do it because I thought, you know, this would be a massive project. You know, th this would be very sensitive, very poignant. And I wasn't really experienced. I mean, I'm still learning as, as a filmmaker, but I think, you know, um, and to do something very sensitive and poignant and relevant, like, it's, it's a challenge. But um, he kind of pushed me a little bit to, to go a bit bigger. So that's when I thought, oh, maybe we could do a bit of a collection of people and kind of weave it in so that's when when i started like looking into other people and i thought yeah you know we we, we have something solid here and that was when we kind of thingy and it was good because he um he yeah it was nice because it was because i again it was rattling in my head like oh you know 
is this a good thing for me to do? And when mm-hmm. I was told family and friends about it, they were like, yeah, this is actually good. But, it, um, you know, also it, it is going to be tough because it is such a sensitive subject. So that was a real learning curve really for me. And it would be later on. Yeah. And there's a lot of responsibility uh, because you have to tell the stories, mm. um, you know, in a certain way to give yeah. it a justice basically. And it's a real life it's not like actors, you know? Um, so, um, how do you, so you mentioned that you heard about some stories, um, and some people that make those great things, but, um, how did you like do further research or how did you hear about those stories like social media or what was the yeah. research? So, um, it was mostly through, so, um, start off with vegan she was very present on news channels and social media and stuff um and her campaigns were very you know viral a lot of people were talking about them um but the first person who i actually got in contact with was a guy called adam lawler who's the second person in documentary young uh young lad who uh was with his friend olivia who sadly uh passed away as a result of the manchester arena bombing um and he got in touch and we just um when we first chatted and stuff, we didn't talk about the bombing. I just wanted to know about him initially. So I kind of got it. And then I kind of got a picture of him and what he's about and what he's like and how it kind of affected him. But I let him, um, I kind of crafted it and let him talk on camera really. Um, but he really opened my eyes and, you know, on how this really affected him, but also like also the good he's doing and how he's just getting on with his life and everything. And then um, with the bikers later on, um, that wasn't anything on social media. There was no news reports about it. Um, That was thanks to my, again, to my producer, Steve. Um, He had a contact in the bike community and he was telling me about that they're doing this, that for the past couple of years they've been doing this ride. Um, So I was like, wow, really, you know. He then got us uh, a meeting with the gentleman, Michael Cox, who's in in the film, um, to talk about it. And because uh, bikers, they, they weren't really picked up by the media and stuff. And, um, you know, it is quite a big thing. And the bikers community likes to be quite private from what I've gathered and stuff. So we were chatting about him and telling him about him what we'd like, kind of like to do and telling him that we are speaking to Fegan. And that was another key thing of getting with when we got Fegan on board, it really massively helped because, again, she is so pivotal to, to the community. And having her support and you know was really really key um, to getting it. But yeah, the bikers were great. That was wonderful, and um, it was great to capture something that no one else has seen before. And I think it kind of had a nice aspect and change in tone for the film as well. Yeah, absolutely. I love that part. Um, and yeah. also, uh, he was talking about like how people judge him because of the yeah. tattoos and all of that. Um, which is entirely true. Like, you know, I, I really liked that part um, as well. Um, and they're like super, you know, big hearted people. Like they have such a good heart usually as I, from my experience. Um, so basically, um, and also do you, did you have some people that mm-hmm. like, um, they want to be on camera or like refused? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's people who, um, I was speaking. I was speaking to who I would have loved to have, you know, who I actually met up with, who I met up in Manchester with. We went to a particular cafe that I used to like to go to called the, uh, it was called the Coffee Pot, and used to meet a couple of people there. And um, but maybe for whatever reason they ended up saying no, and I could understand it. It was very raw for a lot of people, um, but it's very understandable and stuff. And some of them don't want you know, to be seen to, I don't know, taking things over others or something like that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's just about listening and absorbing stuff. I mean, um, that's what it's taught me making, making this film. It's taught me a lot more than, you know, most classrooms could about like just listening and seeing the, the aspects of people and that, you know, the human experience and stuff and what people do in the face of such adversity. Manchester is, you know, is a very, like you say, it rose to the challenge of such a horrific thing. And I think it did it amazingly. Um, and it's, you know, um, we should definitely be talking about that rather than the horror of, uh, well, not just the horror of what happened, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, so 
as you said, like you've learned a lot. Um, mm. Did you have prior experience with like interviewing, interviewing people or like, um, cause it's mm. the first film and it's a big deal, like to interview someone who has been yeah. through very difficult <laughs> things. Yeah. Uh, no, I, uh, I had minimal documentary experience to be honest with you. Um, I had minimal, I had some filmmaking experience, but not again, not on the scale of for an hour and a half documentary. Now I kind of, I kind of, like I say, what I would do is like my, my workflow was like this. So I would kind of, I would read and find people and then the basis would be contacting them on social media or seeing some other way I can contact them. And then it'd be meeting up and listening to them off camera, just me and them and getting an idea and sense of them and communicating, you know, them communicating to me what they've gone through. Also me communicating to them what, what I'm looking to do and what the film's about. Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to what you previously asked, some people didn't like what I was maybe doing and I accepted that and that was fine for me. And it was nice to meet them anyway, and it was good to meet them and I was happy to move on. And some others um, loved what I was doing but didn't sadly have the confidence to come on camera and I could understand, I could fully understand why. And that's, that's the great thing. Um, so it was really just a case of listening and absorbing, but yeah, it was a massive learning process. Um, I mean, editing, ed editing was a massive challenge um, because it was in my head, like it was kind of forming as it, we were going along. Cause I thought if I could get a collection of stories, I could maybe make it like an art kind of thing where if I maybe showed it to a room of 10 people, those people and I then maybe surveyed them maybe afterwards and said, well, which people do you identify with most or who stood out to you the most? Or, you know, um, people would say different answers, maybe depending on different things of, you know, who spoke to them. And that's the great thing because it, it just shows, you know, different ages, different genders, different, yeah, mm -hmm. just everybody, uh, all united in that one event in whatever particular way. I think that was what the uniqueness about it was. And yeah, it was, I had to come up with a editing process as well. And, uh, was really communicating really strongly with my editor. Um, he, uh, Danny Coyne, I'll just give him a shout out because he did an amazing job. Of um, course. And really, really worked well with myself and same with Kelsey, my sound guy and, uh, Tris, my music man and, um, Tevin, my color grader. They all just really like were really sent because it was some of the biggest projects they've ever done. Like, I mean, they were very, they were very experienced in their field, uh, but like an hour and a half solid documentary to grade that, to color that, to edit that, um, was a, a big challenge for, for some of them. Some of them again, uh, yeah. And it was a massive one for myself and my producer Steve and yeah. Um, so what it did was we started in May of 2019 with Fegan, we started a couple of days and I had to balance it with having a job and uni. And I went far. So I'm from, I was originally from Manchester and I was studying down South. So it was like, I had my own car at the time and I was lucky enough so I could, I could travel, but I had to balance it around term times and stuff. And I had to obviously, of course, balance it with the availability of people as well uh, to get key events. So like the, the I was lucky enough to get Fegan and the bikers and uh, Adam all in one block. And then I kind of mm -hmm. went from there. And then, um, after that, we launched a kick, uh, not Kickstart, sorry, Indiegogo campaign and stuff, which didn't do as well as I'd hoped. Some people were generous and stuff, but I thought it would have done better than it, um, it ended up doing. But that was fine. That was another learning experience. I'd never done a crowdfunded campaign. Um, so it was really loads of other things. Some people weren't happy that I was making this film. Some people were angry. Why? Um, well, because basically some people weren't happy because they thought I was broaching the subject that didn't need to be broached or who, who was I to broach the subject? And I had, I asked those questions myself. I was like, you know, who am I? But I think again, ultimately it's about their human experiences that really make that film what it is. And I'm just a man who just happened to see the stories and thought that they were worth, you know, other people hearing about them. When you approach a subject like this, like yeah. you got to be prepared to take the heat. Because... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kind of, yeah, I was kind of, I don't know. I was kind of thinking 
um, it was the heat wasn't very much at all. It was just a couple of people, but mm-hmm. I kind of shrugged them off. And I and for some others who didn't want me to make the film or whatever, I could un- I could completely understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I I I managed to win some of those people around with the end product, with them seeing the film and seeing what I was intending. Because some people like to, you know, they maybe don't have, maybe they pick up, maybe they thought I was going to repeat the same kind of things the documentaries before, and that was that was my whole point. But I'm liking, I like to think maybe that, I don't know, some of those people, again, I, I won round because I think I did a bit differently, but I, I don't fully know. We'll have to see. Um, maybe... I don't know. It's one of those things that will be looked back in a few years' time, and it, yeah, see how things have changed and how those people are today in in that in that time. But um, yeah, um, what I'm ha- most proud of is the people who were in the film. Um, I had mo- pretty much good feedback from them, and they've just been happy with it and said I did them proud. And again, it wasn't about me; it was about them and their stories. And so I'm happy that they're happy with it if, mm-hmm. if that makes sense yeah so you mentioned um your crew so how did you put them together like yeah yeah so uh it started off with me and my producer steve uh we were chatting about it um and again he really liked the idea he thought there was some solid ground for it and I, as i did and we were both re- we're both we, we still are we're both very passionate about it um, because we're both from the city, um, only lived. But what was funny was we met at uni, didn't know each other beforehand, and only lived two miles down the road from each other. That's <laughs> not crazy, right? So we saw real potential. And again, he pushed me a little bit further to say, "Oh, we actually, we could try it." And then I did. I, I was like, "Yes, we could do something with this." And that was when the correlation came of like, "Oh, wow, we've got loads of these little stories. We can kind of weave them together." I started with that, and then obviously we needed to find crew. We found mostly like for the production crew, Manchester based crew, who most of them I didn't uh, pretty much didn't know any of them before that. We had Restar cinematographer again. And the cool thing is is like it was the same with the post crew, same as the production crew. They were all interested by it because it was so poignant and stuff, but they were also very sensitive to it and acute to it. And that's what I really admire about them. And that's why I really like was really happy with the crew because they were so sensitive and caring about the subject matter. And they cared about it enough to to go the extra mile for it and really go for it. Um, so we had resource cinematographer who did a wonderful job, uh, assisted by Jacob, um, who's one of our uh, who stepped into DOP some days and also did camera for other days as well. We had Matthias, a Brazilian chap who was our sound recordist, who did a lot of days and really worked hard. And um, we. <laughs> We had production assistants and other other people who stepped in and came in and rallied round and really just picked up the baton and it was brilliant really. And then again, again with the post crew, it was really helpful. The cool thing is with all the post crew, I pretty much went to uni with most of them. So I knew again, I knew their skill set, I knew their talent, I knew they had talent. Um, and the cool thing is again, they they were willing to help me out and they knew the sensitivity of the subject and they they took great care with it and they crafted it brilliantly. I think that's the thing. I think that's the thing. Time will tell, but I think those conversations are happening and those experiences. I mean, because it was young children who were at that event, a lot of young kids as well. Um, I mean, of course it affects adults, of course, but from such a young age, uh, such a crucial age and to have such a traumatic thing, you know, in the way it affects them and the help that they're going to need and the support they're going to need, you know, it's crucial they get that. And um, I mean, uh, I think it's great. Like, I hope, I, hope, I mean, if, if it can do that and open some people's eyes into getting more support for people, that would be nice. That would be great um, to have an impact like that. But um, yeah, I hope, I hope, I hope those people do get that support because they do, you know, they really need it. And um, it'll be in, it'll be an interesting thing that will be talked about of how things were dealt with in the aftermath. I mean, that is what is going on now because currently there's uh, an inquiry, a public inquiry that's being held to determine, well, it's determined everything that's kind of led up to that point, but it's also determining the response and how we could do things better as a result of 
this tragedy and how we can actually manage things better and get support for people. So I hope that those people do get the support because they do really need it. So in terms of like, um, uh, cause you mentioned funding as well, right? So you, yeah. had, you, you tried Indiegogo. Um, so if that didn't work out as you wanted to, yeah. so what was the other options or how, how did you fund this film? There was no other option. I had to pick up the book. I had to fund it. I had to do it. That's uh, what I wanted to hear. So a lot of the <laughs> so a lot of the crew agreed to to work if um, if maybe something came of it later on, uh, which we're still trying to sort out, uh, which we're hoping to do. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of the crew continued with it, which was great of them uh, and stuff. And for other crew, um, I just I've just had to cover stuff, and it's fine. You know, I've been doing it. I mean, with crowdfunding, crowdfunding is actually, I mean, it's empowered a lot of people to do things. And I think it can be great for some people, but I think it's also a shackle on your foot as a creator that you don't need, in my, in my personal opinion. A lot of funding that is external is because you have to deliver a product to people that you have demands for, that you have delivery for, um, that you have creative, maybe even creative constraints for. Um, so in my opinion, it didn't work out and it opened my eyes of how, cause I, I thought I had maybe, I thought at the time we were ready. I thought we had a solid thing and we, I was going at it every day, but it really takes it out of you. And I personally think, I, I don't think I would try crowdfunding again. Um, because for myself, uh, because I just thought it was very demotivating and draining and a waste of time, which could have been spent on other things, but yeah, it's not easy, you know, of, of course, yourself will, will know, and probably your watchers know. Like funding a, a film is is a difficult process as well. It's probably like one of the biggest obstacles. So it's about relying on yourself of what you can do with the tools you have, and I think that's the thing that I was really I was really lucky to have a lot of support from people, um, and a lot of favors done for me, and a lot of you know things. Um, you know, and a lot of things that people did for me that they didn't have to do, but they they saw the value of the of the project and what I was trying to do, and they they stuck by it, which is great of them and courageous of them. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of promotion, because I know, um, so it's available on Vimeo, right? Yeah. Um, and that's the this the main platform or only yeah. platform. It's currently at the minute the only platform. We're trying to work something out and trying to get it in other venues and stuff. Um, we're going to get some, once I've got some more stuff planned, because obviously, of course, the fifth anniversary of the bombing is coming up. Um, that'll be quite solid and stuff. But we're going to see if we can get it in some more places for people to have access to it. But yeah, it, it's. It, I was glad to release it and stuff. And I just hope some people like, like you say, like yourself, have taken away something from it that, you know, things don't have to be one way. And I think what was interesting was, which I think my film did differently was it took your assumptions and what you had because that you knew the bombing happened. It didn't, there's no footage of it or anything like that, but it acknowledges it happened, but it doesn't show you it. And I think that's why it was different in that way. And I think, I mean, I think that's the main thing that I was proud of that I came up with. I was like, yes, it works, because I didn't know how people would take to it. I mean, there's an ex a repeat of that later on. Do you remember Evie the dancer, who's later on? Mm -hmm. She's like young, yeah. The so dancer, yeah, she was great. Yeah. Have you, so she talks about this photograph that was taken of her, and I couldn't get the rights to that photograph. I didn't, I wanted to Google it, you and I was Google like, it. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to do this. Should you I? Do, it's not a bad photograph. It's it. Well, it's a bad photograph. Yeah. I will let you decide what you think of the photograph, but if eventually you do decide to Google it, um, I tried to get the rights to it and I was stressing about it. Cause I really, obviously I thought she was telling us about this photograph and that's the key point of it because that's how the entire world knows her because people were shocked that she was 14 years old. And obviously in that photograph, she looks, She's very distorted and looks older and stuff. Um, and, you know, people are shocked that this is a 40-year-old girl and that's, you know, how her life has been really affected by it. Um, but it's amazing how she's just powered through. And the thing is, I then was like, 
I was remember talking on the phone to my producer today. I was like, do you know what? No, let let's ditch the photograph. Let's keep what she's saying, but let's ditch it and let people find that you know the photograph is not her. It might be in that photograph, but it's not a representation of her as a human being. It's just what someone had managed to take of her in that horrific moment. Um, so I think that's the cool thing. I think it allows people to kind of work it out and kind of, you know, go and, you know, if they want to see that bro- photograph, fair enough. But I am not going to facilitate that. So Yeah, because it's, yeah, it's not a, like a news piece. Like it's, no. it's, she was telling the story and, I was waiting for that moment that you put that photograph on the screen. And, <laughs> and yeah. And then when she was talking about like how yeah. horrible she felt about it, when she saw it and like how it made her feel, then I realized like, okay, we, we cannot show it. <laughs> we cannot because like, she doesn't want to be remembered for it and she doesn't want to be, just that photograph you know how people know her and that when i the photograph didn't show and i'm like okay i get it, it makes sense <laughs> so it's up to me now whether i want to see it or not you know yeah so exactly. yeah that was clever uh, well it was yeah it was kind of skewed for so i think it was kind of i mean i don't know if you believe in fate but i think it was a decision of fate where like it doesn't need to be seen there it doesn't need to be seen And it gave me hindsight because I was stressing about it not being in. And then I came to the realization <laughs> it didn't need to be in. So that's one of those things where sometimes the situation skews you in a place and you actually get hindsight for it. And that's brilliant. I love I, That's the great thing with the film. I also, it does throw challenge after challenge at you and it's how you combat them and how you deal with them. And um, that makes it, but yeah, really. The, basically the last question, which is the future projects, anything future projects. In, in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I definitely want to keep, uh, I think I'm going to move on to fictional stuff um, because documentary, while it was really brilliant and stuff, I think um, it did take it out of me and stuff. And also I think I would like to do something where I kind of, You know, I'd like to work with actors again and um, I'd also like to, you know, <laughs> the heat as well is a lot for a documentary, <laughs> for that documentary. But it really like, you know, um, it's brilliant. But yeah, being able to be creative and stuff. I, I, I would really love to write a, I've been, I've been taking notes and stuff and I've been like, because what I love to do is take location, pictures of locations and places that look kind of interesting and then you can use them to kind of give you inspiration. But I was thinking maybe, maybe about a sci-fi script uh, kind of set on earth, but kind of a sci-fi script nonetheless. It's kind of, I don't know, kind of a bit of a puzzle for the, for the viewer. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, I think I definitely, a Manchester story will always be something I've done, but I'm happy to move on. I'm happy to that to be the base and to crack on with other things and meet other people and make other things, but always have it with me as something that I did initially and I'm proud to have it initially done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for Thank being so on my much. podcast and yeah, everybody go watch it. I'm going to put the link in the description uh, for a Manchester story and yeah, I wish you the best of luck with the future projects and yeah, keep in touch. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much. Thank you.